this will do it. Hi, everybody. You wouldn't know that we've been doing this for over 20 years up here, <laughs> scrambling around trying to figure out how to operate the tech, but it has changed over in the course of those 20 years. So uh, my name is Deborah Pollock Milgate. I'm a partner here at Barnes and Thornburg in the intellectual property group and part of the life sciences group. And we're thrilled again to host the life sciences lifeline luncheon. Um, thank you everybody. We've had great participation over the last few sessions. And as long as you still keep coming, we will continue to bring these programs. Um, and if you have anything you'd like to see, uh, let us know, but just thank you for coming and supporting. And as always, um, we have a great presentation for you today and it will be led by superstar CEO <laughs> for Indiana Health Industry Forum. And um, I guess this is a topic that comes up more often than you might think based on the interest. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kristen, and good luck. Have fun talking about app as a, apps as medical devices. Great. Thank you. Oh, and there are cards on your table today. If you have questions, I'll come around and grab those for you. And we have this to share amongst us. <laughs> And I think it's on, so we're, we're being held together with, with chewing gum and duct tape a little bit today. So thank you for bearing with us. Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Jones. I'm president and CEO, um, no superstar officially in the title of the Indiana Health Industry Forum. We're the Life Sciences Trade Association here in the state. Um, we've got some new faces here today, which is fantastic. And um, for those of you who don't know us, we've been around for 30 years. And as Deborah said, uh, 20 of those we've been putting on this lunch series. So this is a, this is a, or, or more possibly. Um, but uh, we have a great panel today. And joining us from Florida is also Gretchen Boker, who's on the screen behind me, who um, we'll, we'll be hearing from in just a second. Um, Gretchen and several others of you uh, and I in this room have had a conversation lately where we have been running across small companies that are interested in developing products in, in the medical space, but don't quite realize that what they're doing is creating a medical device in the process and that the FDA has an interest in what's going on in that. Um, and in the, in the interest of keeping as many startups as we can out of jail and um, from being shut down, we thought maybe it would be useful to have a conversation, a broader conversation around that. So we were able to pull together a fantastic panel today. And I'm so glad we have everybody here with us. Um, I mentioned Gretchen Boker. Gretchen is a longtime um, supporter and, and attendee and no stranger to the lunch series. Gretchen is the CEO of Pearl Pathways. A local pearl, uh, local pearl, a local woman-owned um, uh, uh, regulatory affairs consultancy uh, that has recently been purchased by Versity, and uh, Gretchen has has kindly decided to stay in her role as CEO. Um, however, she is enjoying it from um, Florida this week, so we appreciate Gretchen being here, and she's going to do a great job talking through some of the. Uh, regulatory concerns. Also joining me to my right is Chris Atkinson. Chris is the Vice President of Engineering for SEP, another local consultancy that helps with software product development. So all the things that go on inside electromedical devices, um, I've been working with them for years and years and years since they were a teeny tiny little firm and now they're great big and world famous and uh, just delighted to have them here with us today. Also joining us and, and uh, slightly late addition to the panel, but delighted to have him here is Matt Dressler. Matt is the, make sure I get your title right here, the funds manager at Purdue Innovates, um, which is a little bit of a misleader because in a previous life, uh, he worked for Depew Synthes uh, Johnson & Johnson company, but did a lot of the development work and led multinational teams uh, developing um, uh, products for the orthopedic space. Make sure I get this in here. Uh, Sensor-enabled smart devices for surgical decision support of orthopedic procedures. So he knows what he's talking about in this space. He's been there, done it, and he's our, our testimonial on, on how this all comes together in the real world. So we appreciate everybody being here. Um, we're just going to talk through kind of how, how this all goes. So maybe Gretchen, I'm going to ask you to, to kind of kick things off. So if you can tell us, um, uh, how do you know if your device is, your app is, or software is going to be regulated by the FDA? Yes, um, there are certainly many gray areas 
in terms of enforcement, what the FDA calls enforcement discretion. Um, it's often it, it's a matter of, are you making a medical diagnosis or mitigating or treating a disease? And I know a lot of that's regular, regulatory jargon, but um, the bottom line is, um, if you're collecting a information that um, is, say, a questionnaire, something of that nature, uh, you could certainly go to FDA and ask and get their their you know answer on paper, yes or no, um, or go to a consulting firm. Um, we've taken people to FDA because the investors wanted a yes or no, but we're pretty comfortable with uh, giving you our opinion based on how other products are are handled in the industry. Um, it A lot of it comes down to risk, quite honestly, and, and risk of um, harm to a patient or a group of individuals based on uh, treating them medically uh, with the information that you obtain from the software algorithm. Chris, maybe you're, you're a good one to talk us through the difference between software in a medical device and software as a medical device. Sure. Um, so software in a medical device um, is really when, they're, when software is running inside of a piece of hardware. So if you think about an infusion pump, or maybe a handheld blood glucose meter that has software running inside of it. That's software in a medical device. Software as a medical device is um, the software is kind of standalone, so to speak. And so, um, but the the things that the software does fall into the categorization of a medical device, and therefore that software is treated as if it were a medical device. And then all the regulations and the way you go about doing development applies at that point. Those. Um, Matt, maybe if you want to take a couple seconds and introduce introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your previous role, and then um, um, yeah, so get us started with some of that. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So I dealt a lot with surgical decision support, and so as you've already heard, um, you know, does your thing, whether it's a software or, or anything else, right? Is it is it providing new information to the surgeon that they couldn't have had? otherwise, right? So are you just transmit, taking data and putting it on a dashboard? Not a medical device, right? If you're um, taking imaging and then um, doing something clever with it, right? And then reporting it to the surgeon, that's a medical device. Um, if you're taking um, some sort of uh, uh, measurements of the patient, right? And again, creating a risk factor, something like that, medical device. Um, and so that's where we sat a long time or that I worked in a medical device company, and so we weren't as afraid about medical devices. I would say where we got caught up a lot is um, in this new AI, ML, sort of data-driven decision-making. Where does your data come from? Do you have um, the rights to use that data to create a medical device? And I don't mean to sort of sidetrack us, but we weren't concerned about medical devices. We were really concerned about where does the data come from? What rights do you have? Um, but I maybe just in terms of getting back to um, the, the sort of conversation at hand, um, uh, what are you claiming? <laughs> what are you saying that you're doing? Um, and that that's hard, right? Cause you're, you're going to be tempted to go and say something really spectacular. That's probably going to take you into a medical device field. Um, and if you sort of shrink it, it sort of feels, eh, but that's where you really need to talk to your customers and understand what job are you solving for your customers? Great. Speaking of customers, um, Chris, could you talk us to us a little bit about, you know, when people come to you, and, and I understand you guys tend to work with slightly larger companies, um, but even for small companies, when people when people are getting into this business or getting ready to, to put a project together, what kinds of things do you, do you kind of wish that they came prepared with? Um, or what would be a list of things that, that maybe maybe small to medium-sized companies should be should be thinking about when they're they're getting ready to start a project in this space. Yeah, to your point, um, you know, most of our customers that are already kind of device companies and established, like they kind of have their act together. Um, so I'll speak more to companies that are maybe new or, or just getting into 
uh, product that might become a medical device. And so um, I think one of the things that I would, would want them to understand is, you know, if they're seeking outside help, like from a company like ours that does software development, um, at the end of the day, like they, somebody has to own being the device manufacturer, as the FDA says. Um, and so that's, um, they might think that they get to offload some of that to somebody who's actually going to do the bulk of the work for their product. Uh, but the reality is that's not the case. Um, they will generally own the, being the manufacturer. And so uh, most of that regulatory burden then falls on them. Um, we can be helpful because we have a lot of experience doing this and we can help guide them and make good decisions about uh, the way they approach the software development, the documentation that gets created that might go into submissions down the road and things like that. But um, I think it's just helpful for them to understand kind of their role in that and, and we can help them as much as we can. Uh, we do also kind of try not to also be a regulatory consultant. So we're good at software. Uh, we're not really necessarily experts in the regulatory aspect of things. So we would encourage somebody who's new at it to also find somebody who can advise them from a regulatory standpoint. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of someone who can do that, Gretchen, uh, <laughs> would you be able to talk to us a little bit about what, what does maybe the documentation burden look like for a company that's doing this? Is this, um, if, if again, if you're taking it from the perspective of maybe a small startup um, who are maybe more likely to be some of your clients, um, uh, what, what kinds of things do you wish they had prepared or what kinds of things do you talk to them about as you go through this process? Yeah, the, the hard part is um, defining the line when you are doing regulated work. Often, uh, you know, it's not uncommon that you cross that line and you didn't really realize it. Um, and so you may have to go back and, and beef up some documentation. But, you know, it's all based on risk. So, and, and that is... Um, failure risk, risk to the patient, et cetera. So um, it, it's a sliding scale, um, you know, but, but if you think of it in terms of if something in the software fails, what is the potential harm? And, and that's the way the FDA is going to approach it. Um, the higher the risk, and I'll add in there the more novel, your product is, if there's nothing else like it out on the market, odds are you're going to have a higher regulatory <clears throat> burden equals more paperwork, more testing than you normally would. So if you see people who um, have, have come to you and I'm, I, I, we've had this conversation, I know, um, uh, with something that is pretty far developed, um, uh, but they're maybe not aware that there was a regulatory uh, burden included in all of this. What uh, what what are some of the consequences of that action? <laughs> well, um, you know, the good news is the FDA moves pretty slow in most instances. <laughs> um, but the bad news is there's um, others other factors in play. For example. If someone like a competitor were to look at your website and see what you're saying and look at your 510K or maybe you don't have one filed with FDA or you're not registered with FDA, they, they can call the FDA and complain and the FDA has to follow up on those. Um, they, they can't just ignore the calls. Um, Often you're out at trade shows, you're promoting your product. There are FDA uh, individuals, employees that wander around these trade shows and will come and talk to you and ask you questions. Um, so you may invert, inadvertently get yourself into trouble there, right? Um, but the bottom line is, you know, you'll get inspected, you could get a warning letter. Um, the bad press probably hurts your business more than anything and ultimately, you know, taken off the market and potentially fined. So not a great outcome. No. I might add to that a little bit. <laughs> <Please>. um, <clears throat> from a software standpoint to um, the FDA kind of expects that you, you have 
processes in place um, before you start product development. And so um, if you've if you've already built a lot of software um, and then you realize you're a medical device, there's it, get, it can get really hard um, to go back and show that we had a plan and we executed that plan and we went about building what's been built um, in a way the FDA expects. Um, so sometimes you have to really backtrack a lot. And uh, I've seen cases where we had to go back and do like code inspections and a lot of building out of tests for software that, that didn't get created the first time around. So it can be a, a pretty big burden to kind of take that step backwards too. Is there a um, quality system that goes along with all of this that people should know about? Uh, for sure. Maybe Gretchen can speak more to it, but I kind of alluded to that, that, that it's part of the plan, but, you know, once you're a medical device manufacturer, there's a quality system regulation. And so they expect that your company is going to have a quality system. And that means a whole bunch of things. Um, but one of which, if I speak to software is kind of your approach to design and development of software. Matt, do you have anything you'd like to throw in on that on? <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I'm trying to see what's the best place to jump in. Um, I, a couple of thoughts, right? So this is not software, but I, many moons ago. So the, the, you want to know what class of medical device you're working with, right? Uh, so there was an example. Uh, many moons ago, we were creating personalized surgical uh, instruments. And so the, you know, you get a CT or an MRI, right? And they'd customize the instruments according to your, to your bones. Um, those most instruments in orthopedic um, uh, procedures are class one devices. Um, essentially, they upclassified that one. So they went from class one to class two. And uh, in a nutshell, what that means is you have to submit your, your design control and all your documentation to the FDA to receive clearance with, with, with class one. You have to still do those design controls, but you don't need to do the submission, right? Um, and so there were many companies that had to remove that product from the market uh, until they what they went into the submission and then heard back from the FDA. And, and in this case, it's not good that FDA moves slowly because those, those instruments are no longer being used and you're no longer uh, have customers. Um, so one of the things is, yeah, is it a medical device, but what class of medical device is it, right? Because that also has a, a certain amount of burden associated with it. For those. Um, so, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, you're building the software, you're, you're all these component pieces to it. Um, one of the big things that um, everybody has probably caught this last week was a huge cyber attack on some of the healthcare institutions in the country. Is, talk a little bit about the, how you build in some security into this process, or but not giving away the shop clearly, but um, the cyber security concerns that go along with some of this. I'll just say address. briefly before I pass the mic is I, I, <laughs> we try to avoid it, uh, meaning um, when you build in features, like why does it need to be there? So we launched a robot. Everybody wanted that thing to be internet connected, but along came with that a lot of burdens, right? A lot of testing that needs to be done. And those tests can change from country to country, depending on what region you're working in. And so while it was maybe undesirable at first um, to have a robot that wasn't connected to the internet, it also allowed us to get to market a whole lot faster. So again, like be very clear about what features, you can play the hokey pokey game, right? Take the feature in, take the feature out, right? What's associated with, with sort of that, the burden of keeping that feature in, um, and really make sure that 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 thing that you want needs to be there. Um, to I guess add to the, the kind of discussion on cybersecurity, um, you, you really have to start thinking about that stuff pretty early when you're talking about software. Um, a lot of companies will uh, start to pay attention to. Um, there, there's, I'm uh, sorry, let me back up a little bit. Um, generally, we'll start with like a risk assessment. And so you have a team that's thinking about um, what are the ways that my product could be penetrated or uh, if it's got data being sent, like how can that be interrupted or hijacked and data taken? Uh, how can I ensure connections are going to the system or the, the device that I need them to? Um, and, and a number of other kind of things in that regard. But there's this risk assessment that's done and it's a lot of brainstorming around um, how could we be vulnerable? Um, and then that kind of moves into what are the things we can do from a design and, and software implementation standpoint um, to avoid those or mitigate those. Um, and then that kind of plays into how the software is, is built to avoid those 
Um, it can also play out in um, later stages when you have working software, you might be um, paying to have penetration testing done. Um, it gets more complicated when your product is talking to other systems or other devices. It just kind of opens up more channels for um, bad things to happen and bad actors to uh, ruin, ruin your day for you. Um, um, <clears throat> another thing that happens a lot in software, especially kind of software as medical device, is um, you start to keep an inventory of uh, what they'll call off-the-shelf software or um, generally you're writing a software application, but if it's running on a mobile device or it's running on a PC, there's a whole lot of software that's at play besides what you maybe you wrote for your product. And so you have to start keeping track of all of those and you might have to do a little bit of assessment of those um, uh, in terms of what have those companies done to avoid cybersecurity or make their products less vulnerable to those. Um, and so you're also kind of keeping account of all those things that you use and maybe the state of those. So they kind of play into the state in terms of um, cybersecurity protection, the state of your product. Mm -hmm. Gretchen, do you have anything to add to that? Anything that, that people should be particularly paying attention to or that the FDA might be looking for in particular these days? Well, I, I, I think it's important to understand that you're never done. Um, that you know you you will continue to add or, or make changes to your software there will be new um, means of hacking if you will or or breaking and getting into your software so you you've always got to kind of stay on top of it and and keep developing Great. Uh, I might add to that as well, like um, because software, especially software as a medical device, can have so many other pieces of software that are kind of helping your software accomplish what it's doing. Um, there's kind of some post market activities uh, you got to be paying attention to. So imagine you have a mobile app that's a medical device and um, Apple releases their new operating system update. Like <clears throat> there's some diligence on your part to make sure that your product still works with that um, and try to get ahead of all of the mobile apps out there. Everybody, they're using your app, um, using, um, getting the update and then having some problems maybe you weren't aware of or didn't anticipate. Is that something your firm does <clears throat> we, for people or is that is that generally a burden? I mean, it's on the manufacturer, but is that something you can outsource or is that something people do in-house more? Yeah, we, we have not done a lot of that. We've done, I would say, a little bit of that. Um, our experience has been that uh, most of the manufacturers kind of take that themselves. It's it's very intermittent work um, and, and sometimes it's kind of on a, a cadence in terms of platform operating system upgrades and things like that. Um, I don't really know if there are other companies out there that really kind of target doing that. Anything to add to that? Good. Um, I will remind everybody you have uh, some little white note cards on your table. Um, and if you have a question you'd like to ask, um, Deborah will just raise your hand or wave it a little bit and Deborah will come around and pick it up and we'll work it into the conversation. We got, we've got some really good ones here. Um, uh, uh, question from the audience. What are experiences with reimbursement for software as a medical device? Are insurers open to software as a service pricing models? And honestly, Pearl doesn't do reimbursement. Yep. So uh, unfortunately, I'm I'm not going to be much help there. But you know, I I'll acknowledge it's an extremely important aspect and something you you need to pay a lot of attention to. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> It's a simple question. It's a complicated answer, just like yeah. anything in medical devices, right? So uh, the, you know, you've insurance companies, right? So the people who pay, right, aren't always how you, I don't know, it's just really complicated model. So uh, we have something. So if there's a code associated with with it already, right, you, you that's one way for the, right. the doctor or whomever to get revenue from it. And that doesn't have to be the same way in which you bill them, right? So it doesn't have to be like a pass through. Um, so we had, um, you know, uh, again, doing digital surgery, we have an iPad, uh, uh, 
wow, it's on a it's on a Mayo stand, right? So it's in the operating room. Um, they pull in images from uh, some X-rays, right? And they do some analysis on the X-rays, and that helps the surgeon understand what's best for the patient. Um, that was uh, reimbursed under uh, guided surgery, right? But then we had a bunch of different um, uh, models to work with with the doctor, right? Whether it's an acquisition, right? A capital outlay, right? Monthly software or, or however, right? So those two things are, are a bit disconnected. I would say one of the things that's harder to do is go and get a new reimburse, reimbursement code. That's one of the things that at least my experience was like, oh, ooh, that's new. Um, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. But- um, That's not easy for anybody. But. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but, but, so uh, we were having a conversation at the table over lunch, right? So. Um, for big companies, there's a lot of institutional knowledge on how things were done before, and that can help really well until you start to do something highly innovative or something new. And that's where that institutional knowledge sort of like that, that inertia is hard to, to, to move away from, right? So some of the newer companies, I would say it's, it's easier, I don't know, at least institutionally to go and do something new because it's not like, Hey, this is the way we've always done it. Why are you doing something new? So, um, complicated, uh, complicated answer to a simple question. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, the other question is, how has AI impacted how software as a medical device is regulated? Has there, has there been an impact? And, and if so, what are some of the, uh, the changes you're seeing there? Are there guidances? Well, yeah, certainly. And I think, um, well, I know FDA just published a white paper yesterday um, about I AI. Like um, and how they're going to handle it, what they're going to focus on. Uh, but essentially, AI is treated as software. It, it's they they take the software um, guidances and approach and and just apply it to AI. I mean, even even go online on FDA's website and look at they, there's a published list of all the devices approved with uh, AI and machine learning. I think there's a temptation to sort of say, hey, I've got this AI algorithm and it's going to continue to learn. Um, and at least when we were doing it, like that was sort of like, ooh, that's uh, from an FDA perspective. So I think our approach, or at least the approach at the company that I was with at the time, um, was to kind of, um, what is the governance of that AI, AI model, right? You can't just sort of learn on the fly and redeploy that whenever you're ready, right? That, that sort of, that becomes... Um, potentially a new submission, particularly if you are changing your indications for use, right? So now I've got this new data and now I'm going to deploy a feature that I didn't have in my original submission, right? And that again, from the outset, um, like that sounds like a pretty cool, pretty cool uh, evolutionary strategy, right? But you have to think about, okay, I've changed my indications for use. Either my population has changed or I'm telling the surgeon something new or I'm treating the, the, the disease, a different kind of disease or treating it differently, right? That's one of the things to, to watch out for. Um, and then it's just, again, where does the data come from? Uh, what's the quality of the data, right? A whole lot of data governance goes into that as well. For that. The, um, uh... Along with AI and, and data, there are what do you do with all the data and how do you store it and what does that what does that all entail with uh, with such an out? Yeah, so my experience outcome. is actually the opposite of that. So um, again, the, the the tool that I told you about that goes into the OR, you, you upload X-ray images to it, right, and it tells something about the surgeon. It had the ability to acquire data. Um, but in order to get the data, you have to have an agreement with the hospital, you have to have an agreement with the surgeon, you have to have an agreement with the patient, right? And in the meantime, you've got sales folks who just want to make a sale. So actually what happened, and, and I can't blame them. So this is not a this is not a this is not a pejorative like um, but there's a there's a tension, and I think your company has to come up with a strategy and everybody has to be aligned to that strategy, whether it's you know, you want your product in the market, you want people using it, or do you want to wait until you've got all the agreements in place in order to take up the data, right? And, and do something cool with that data. And again, like those, those conversations with those companies or the hospitals, right? The health healthcare institutions, they want to know what are you going to do with the data and what is the additional benefit that you're going to do as you collect that data. And for us to, again, our experience is we're going to collect the data, then we're going to do some awesome stuff with it. Um, that doesn't fly so well. Um, and so data, at least at, 
uh, so I was part of Johnson and Johnson was, was relatively hard to come by. And there was that tension between, are you going to be patient enough to acquire the data? Are you gonna have a clear enough vision that you communicate for people to give you the data? Or do you just want it to go in and do the job that it needs to do for the surgeon and then be done with it? Uh, and <clears throat> maybe a little different approach. Um, I think we, we see oftentimes companies that are building um, medical apps, mobile apps, um, have a desire to have the data collected by that app, like make it to a backend system somewhere. Um, and so uh, the simplest thing I think is to just keep that data local and that makes things a lot simpler uh, when you start sharing it to a backend system. Um, even if that is like part of your product or you own that data, um, it starts to open the door to some other things that you have to be mindful of, a little bit of getting the data from the app in this case um, to that system, but also um, protecting the data when it's there. Um, and then once you start, you know, sometimes companies will build uh, web apps that also will access that data, maybe make it available to clinicians or things like that. And so as you start to make more uses of the data or more things access the data, then that can complicate things as well. And you have to start uh, paying a lot more attention to other things. So I'm just trying to give you a sense of um, if you can keep, keep the data, data isolated, um, you can make things simpler for yourself. Uh, the more you need to move it other places so it can be shared, um, it gets more complicated. And then there's a little bit of a notion of if you're just storing it to retrieve it and display it somewhere else, um, that can keep your world pretty simple. Once you have the data in a backend system, it's, um, it kind of opens the door to be able to start processing the data or maybe applying algorithms to the data. And that can kind of kick you into another level of, of complexity in terms of FDA regulations and what they would expect to see. Uh, that too. <laughs> There's another another one, GDPR. So I'm not an international expert, but GDPR is European regulations and uh, uh, data rights, um, and they can be uh, a challenge, right? So uh, just a quick scenario, right? So somebody can submit their data, uh, and again, you have to have um, uh, an agreement in place for them to go and use that data, but then they can decide, you know what? Hey, I want to opt out of this. So you have to have a mechanism in place for them sort of after the fact to go and remove that data, right? And that could be a challenge, um, particularly if you begin anonymizing the data and all that sort of stuff that people want to do, right? So GDPR, if you want to do something internationally, GDPR is something you probably want to look at um, sooner rather than later. But I guess um, don't be scared by it, right? I mean, there's plenty of things you can do within the United States with just regulations. Any other international implications that you ran across oh, in your experience? That... Um, it's just different. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody uh, has a different flavor. Yeah, I think the sooner that you know what your what your kind of go to market strategy, you're going to go in this country, and then this country, and then this country. Um, you want to know how similar and different the regulations are in those countries, um, and then um, just like anything else, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yep. Uh, uh, translations. This may be something people forget about. And I don't know that that's a regulatory burden. Maybe it is, but like mm -hmm. iconography and, and translations, that's one of the things is like, oh yeah, of course, right? I, I, someone, one of the things that sort of caught me. Is... Gretchen, do you have, uh, you do work with other, other agencies besides the FDA. Do you have um, any thoughts on other works or other groups and how they approach the issue? Yeah, I mean, there there is attempts to harmonize um, through the working groups, but um, th the reality is it is different. And it just needs to be integrated as part of the development plan um, sooner than later in terms of what geographies or markets are most important to you. Um, we're often approached by European companies wanting to get in the US, right? And and they're um, surprised at what we're not worried about and equally surprised at what we are worried about because it's, it's different. So there's harmonization in the works, but we're not there yet. Right. Right, okay. So just, I guess, maybe along that, just kind of thinking it through a little bit more and what, what are the challenges that we had, right? It could lead to different versions of software, right? Mm -hmm. Because this this bit has been cleared for a particular yeah. region, but not for other regions. And so 
again, the sort of login information and, and um, login restrictions, you need to know who's logging in, what rights they have to the particular data, what, what region are they connecting to, right? What are the regulations in that country? Um, and then, as I mentioned before, that could lead to different versions existing throughout the world. And you've got to be able to manage that, deploy it appropriately, right? And not get it crossed up. Yeah, uh, question, even talking to, um, you know, our, our company, IT group, that um, there is a, a lot of um, invasion hacking going on from other countries and, and trying to figure out a plan in terms of where we're going to connect to our own systems and, and from what countries we will or won't. It's um, It's everywhere. I uh, might just add to um, software specific, like in software development, how you deal with language translations, just to have a sense for that. Um, uh, the, the good news is that a lot of the platforms, like mobile platforms, um, have, have developed to the point where um, switching languages is pretty easy to do. Um, so there's not a lot of work to be done there. So a lot of the work just really becomes um, getting the, maybe if you're building the, in this country, the English words that are displayed on the screen to you're probably paying for like a translation house to do all those translations, integrating that back into the product. Uh, there can be some additional testing that needs to be done because you might've found that something fits in English, but when you get it back translated in a different language, it doesn't fit quite so well. So um, that can make things a little more complicated. Absolutely. Um, uh, question from the audience. Uh, does the FDA have trusted third-party providers like Greenlight Guru, AWS, et cetera? I am not aware of anything. No. I mean, there's certainly trusted third-party reviewers that they outsource reviews to, but not, not service providers. Okay. Good to know. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to just read this one, I think. Uh, with increasing complexity and capability and the advent of all the AI and machine learning applications, how are investors and insurance underwriters thinking about risk profiles of these technologies, cyber risk, regulatory risk, et cetera? Anybody have a thought on that? Investors in whom? Investors in insurance companies? Yeah. Not. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, anything you've run across in the Purdue sphere? Yeah. I mean, for that? What, what I could. So. Um, the best thing I can say in response to that is there are a ton of venture capitalists that are engaging in AI uh, ventures, right? And so it's a hot space. There's people who are knowledgeable in that space. Um, and certainly if you were to get it connected in that, make sure that they know the space because there are intricacies and, um, and nuances as we've sort of touched on here. Um, but in terms of, I don't know, they need to know the space is probably the best I could say at this point. Um, or become it, close friends with people that do. <laughs> That's always a good plan. <laughs> um, uh, so it kind of dovetailing on the, the second to last question there. Um, uh, for folks you've worked with, are there, are there services, tools, resources, things that you recommend um, aside from the companies we all represent um, in the first place, but uh, were there particular services that, that were particularly helpful to you as you were developing things for Johnson & Johnson or? Uh, maybe we used, uh, we were in transition, I guess. So we, we were a medical device company. We were becoming a, a software as a medical device company. So a lot of the things were new. Um, a lot of the things we did from scratch. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I don't have a Rolodex of um, services that, yeah. Um, but I, I would say that those 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 um, places are becoming more sophisticated as well. Uh, HIPAA sort of came up, so right. So sort of, if you if you happen it happen to be doing some sort of cloud storage or something like that, or you happen to be managing data, right? You want to make sure that it's HIPAA compliant. Um, I think that's. I don't think there are sort of any individuals, but certainly AWS and all the sort of Google Cloud services, Microsoft, all of them should be should have sort of HIPAA compliant places to store things. Um, yeah, but we we did a lot of stuff from scratch. 
Well, and that's the beauty of being a larger company is you have the you have the the capabilities to do that and and find those. I, I think it's just growing pains. We just didn't know any better at the time. Yep. So, well, and being cutting edge that helps too, for sure. Um, I think somebody mentioned Greenlight Guru, but I think they offer kind of a product to help new companies like have a quality management system uh, pretty quick. I don't really, I'm not that familiar with their product, but I know they're a local company and, and I imagine there's competitors they have as well, but I would imagine that would be very helpful if you're brand new into the medical device space because that's a lot to figure out uh, on your own. Yeah, we generally start with a um, what I would call a right-sized quality management system. And then as your company develops and grows, we um, would you then add on pieces. And as you get into different areas, then you are, are constantly rethinking and and you know developing a clearer plan of what you need long term. So start small baby steps uh, it, and the FDA is very approachable. Um, it, it's not a, a big deal at all to put together your plan and go to them and say, okay, uh, help me understand how I'm regulated and, and they will. I think as you do your design development, right? Or any sort of partner that you're with, have you, you need to do your due diligence, right? Have you done? Have you worked with medical devices, right? Are you either handling data or software development, um, you know, design controls, risk management, usability, those kinds of things. Um, need to have some familiarity with it, as we've already sort of said. If you if you work with a company to sort of get started, right, you may do that in such a way that you have to go backwards again in order to do it under proper proper uh, documentation, right? And so I would encourage folks just to do due diligence as you as you um, if you think that you're heading that medical device. Um, uh, direction, um, be connected to somebody who's familiar with it. Choose good partners in that process. Um, uh, touching on a slightly sensitive topic here, um, uh, any sense of what the cost of compliance might be to, to bring something forward? Um, and, I, and I know, Chris, you and Gretchen have, have different components of this kind of a thing. So if there's just sort of a ballpark figure you could you could throw out there. Um, let me let me speak a little bit to I guess the the work that might go into building software if you find out you have a medical device on your hand, um, and then maybe I'll venture a guess at putting a dollar account, dollar to that. Something uh, in the ballpark. Yeah. We don't, we don't have to be specific. <laughs> Nobody's holding you to it. Um, you know, uh, the FDA kind of expects you to do a lot of things when you have a medical device in your hand, and so from a software standpoint, um, it, it kind of starts with requirements, documents, specifications for what you're going to build. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they refer to these as design inputs. Um, so there will be a fair amount of work to do that. Um, those can be I don't know, 20 to 50 page documents, depending on the device. Um, then there is work to do um, software design and architecture. Um, it could be it can be a simple document, um, especially if your product is fairly straightforward, uh, but it can get complicated too as the device gets more complicated or the safety risk goes up. Um, there is work to obviously write the software. There is work to do testing, kind of unit and integration level testing. There's verification testing to be done. Um, there is validation work, which is um, kind of user studies, uh, things like that. So there's there's more work to doing medical device, but if it's strictly software, those are some of the things that um, you might not be used to doing if you've done if you've done software, but you've not done a, a medical device software um, might be a surprise to you. Um, uh, <clears throat> large companies that are building mobile apps, I mean, they're um, if it's if it's a medical mobile app, the app itself, um, they could be spending a few million dollars to do that. Um, some of that would be, you know, help from an outside company, but um, they have, you know, software development uh, people inside potentially or hire that out, um, software testing people inside or not. Um, they're probably paying somebody to help them with 
um, design of the product, um, even like user user design, as well as conducting studies, um, things like that. Yeah, I think that's something important uh, to remember is that you may end up in clinic in 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 the clinic doing uh, studies or running interference studies. I know some of the universities, um, Rose Holman, I'm sure Purdue. Um, offer programs where they'll help you out initially, um, give their students some excellent experience in preparing uh, software or, you know, proof of concept kind of work. Um, so there, there's ways to cut edges, but um, if, if you're not thinking of, you know, a few years and millions, then you're probably don't have the stomach for it. And that's where I was going with that. Thank you. I, my, my point in asking the question was really around, so if you're a small company and you're trying to figure out how much you're going to have to fundraise, what are some of those steps? And you covered that nicely. And, and what is that, that timeline really going to look like? Um, and Gretchen, you did, did great with that one. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any final questions from the audience? Anybody have a last, last call here? Make a, make a, question. Um, how about some last thoughts from the panelists? Any, what advice would you give people who are, are starting down this train or are well down it already? Or <laughs> yeah, I think I don't think apps are going away. So we, where do we go from here with this maybe? Yeah. So you, you heard a little bit from it from Chris just then, right? Um, the, the development starts with understanding the user, what job are you trying to solve, right? Those user, user requirements, right? Specifications for your software. Um, you know, I, um, I work at Purdue and work with faculty and, and sort of help faculty get um, the, the IP that's generated through the research out in, 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 into, the, into the world. Um, and so sometimes that is a solution looking for a problem. Um, if, if you do that with your software, I, rightly or wrongly, right? So you, you've developed a thing and now I've got this thing and I got to go and do it. Oh, it's a medical device. Now I've got to go back and, and do the documentation again. Um, so like in either of those two cases, you're, 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 you, you either did very quick development, right. Um, outside of uh, those guidelines or you're wed to your solution more strongly than the problem. Um, you can end up going backwards. And while it may feel faster at the time, <laughs> you're going to set yourself, you're running at risk essentially. Um, so my, my encouragement is, um, Go back to the customer, understand the need, understand the job you're trying to solve, understand what you fit, right? And then start to build what your commercial model is going to look like. If I do that, how much money am I going to get from it? How am I going to get reimbursed? We had the previous question, right? It can be very complicated. Um, you don't have to do it in a waterfall fashion, right? So if you, if you wait to get everything figured out, like that's not going to work. But I think it's, it's important to sort of understand like, okay, I'm, I'm moving forward at risk right? That's fine. Um, but just know it, right? Uh, and really, again, start start with your customers and end with your customers. Uh, I think in general, if you ask a software person, like, can we make it do this? They're going to say, oh, sure, you can. <laughs> just a matter of time and money. Um, uh, my, my, I guess, encouragement there really is around uh, there, you have an opportunity to make lots of decisions in the process of, of building a product that might be a medical device. And um, those decisions can help you uh, avoid making it more complicated. Um, now that might evolve over time, but I think if you can keep it simple um, as much as you can, you can avoid some headaches and still allow yourself room for the product to evolve as you understand the market needs and maybe have your product out there and see how it's doing. Um, and then add more complexity later and, and be able to kind of adapt to that. Gretchen? Yeah, I think um, what we often see is uh, you have to have a, a clear plan and you stick to the plan. Um, we, as I said, we often see companies, small companies spinning because they're constantly rethinking or re-guessing or or um, coming up with new ideas. What if we, and then we could, and why don't we, um, if you can just keep moving forward. Um, 
odds are no matter what you do, your first iteration out of the gate is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be exactly what you want. And, uh, you know, as I said before, you're never done. You're, you're going to constantly improve because the world's going to be changing around you. And so that's going to cause you to have to rethink different features and interfaces and um, additional development for your software. I think building on those two comments, right? I've got um, uh, wreckage in my rear view of when we've productized too soon. Um, and so I would encourage you like, um, don't undervalue wireframes, like very simple things that, again, go to your customer, take these wireframes, these sort of um, uh, things that look like a product but aren't a product yet. Because if you're wrong, right, you could just throw it away and very quickly adapt once you've got time in software development, right? And maybe there's a back end that doesn't work the way that you want it to work now, right? Now, all that technical debt has really, I mean, you've got to live with that. So, I would encourage you, like, use those low fidelity prototypes, right? And and I call it fail fast, learn fast, <laughs> um, and learn what doesn't work, right? And then you can start to productize. Is that it? Well, I think we've pretty much reached the end of our time. I'll uh, get you out here a little bit early, but thank you all for joining us for this month's edition of Life Sciences Lifeline. Uh, the, thank you, Deborah. My <laughs> Vanna White in the corner there is pointing out the Biofutures magazine that is on the table in front of you. Please take copies with you. Um, that's our annual magazine. It just came out on Friday in the Indianapolis Business Journal um, and talks about all kinds of things that are happening and happening in our ecosystem here. So, so get that. We have several of our folks who have um, provided commentary and op-eds in that today. Deborah, thank you very much. She's in there. Um, so give it a good read and um, uh, and or leave it for somebody else. So take copies to share. I've got boxes and boxes <laughs> and boxes. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend or great week, Tuesday. <laughs>